So, uh, hello. Before we start our next uh, presentation, our last presentation for the day, I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to let you know that the work that we do at Alpha Canada, Alpha One Canada, could not be done without the generous support of all of our sponsors, uh, Griffles, CSL Bearing, and Alphanet Canada. We are extremely grateful um, for everything that you do and that you support us. Um, we, we could not do half of the work we do without all of your support. So thank you very much. So we have a bit of a, uh, we're taking a bit of a turn with our uh, presentations we're going to complete today uh, with a little presentation on some music therapy. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Elizabeth Francoeur. Elizabeth will be sharing music therapies for people living with alpha-1 or chronic lung diseases. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. I feel like I'm the, you know, the lady at the workout, the gym, and telling you what to do. Um, so thank you for having me. This is really exciting. I uh, did present for Alpha One uh, Canada over the internet, um, and then they invited me again, so I was really pleased. So um, today, the way it's gonna work, it's gonna be more personable, and if I do some uh, music uh, intervention examples, I'm gonna have a real audience, so it's not gonna feel as weird as having to do it in front of my computer camera and not seeing people responding. So thank you again for having me. I'm sorry I don't have any skin pictures. <laughs> uh, so, so you're not gonna get a slide where you're gonna go like, oh. <laughs> so um, let me find a little thing here. So I guess it's the green arrow. So my name is Elisabeth Francoeur. Um, I do different things in life. I'm a school psychologist. I'm a music therapist. I'm a professional musician. And I'm also a board certified behavior analyst. So depending on what the people are calling me for, I do different things. So, um, but my, my main thing right now is uh, school psychology. And I have my music, my private practice as a music therapist. So uh, music therapy, a lot of people are thinking, well, what is it, <laughs> right? So. Um, music therapy, this is from the Canadian Association for Music Therapy, uh, their definition. It is from 1994, however, we, are, we have just updated it, and uh, we're going to have a new website this year, so we're going to have a newer updated definition, but until now, this is what it is. <laughs> um, so we are using music and its elements, whether it's rhythm, melody, uh, you know, uh, range, color, all of those things. We can use them, just, we can use just one element or put a few together. And we're working on objectives that are non-musical. We're not there to teach music. We're not there to entertain people. We're really there to work on objectives that are not musical, but we're using music to achieve those objectives. So depending on who we have in front of us or the group of people we have of us, we will uh, work on you know, mental uh, domains, uh, physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what's great about music is that it's creative, it happens through time, it's adaptable in the moment. Well, that's if you have live music with a, a, li uh, a live music therapist because you can't do that with recorded music. Um, and it's nonverbal. And for a lot of people that we do work with, the verbal aspect can be a great barrier. Um, and also, it's very accessible. Music is pervasive. It's all over the world. It's part of every culture. So just by that fact, you can create really quickly a relationship with someone. OK, so what do music therapists do? Well, 
like any other health professional, we do an assessment over one or two or three sessions, depending again on who we have in front of us, and we assess their strengths and their needs, because in our sessions, we're going to want to exploit their strengths um, and not just focus on the deficits. So we're really a strength-based uh, therapeutic approach. Um, so based on our assessment, we will design and apply music therapy interventions based on the needs and the strengths. And if possible, and the people are in front of us and they're capable, we will engage them in the treatment planning. Um, and if we work in a setting like a hospital or a school, very often we'll, we're part of the, the multi-team. Uh, and uh, we're part of treatment planning and uh, ongoing evaluation, and we do some follow-up. Um, so some settings of where music therapists work, we work in schools and hospitals, like, and in some different units, like behavioral health units, neonatal care units, palliative care, uh, rehab. We have a lot of music therapists work in nursing homes, um, with cancer patients, group homes, long-term care, et cetera, et cetera. So music therapists can work with very varied uh, populations. And I have to say that at this point, music therapists, they can't do everything. They will pick their area of expertise. Um, so if, I, if somebody were to call me tomorrow and say, hey, we wanna offer you a position on the NICU, I'll say, well, I don't have those skills and <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how to do that, so I'm gonna refer you to someone else. Um, so when, if you are thinking maybe after this, that maybe music therapy would be part of a complementary aspect to your standard therapy or what you're doing for treatment, uh, when you call up someone, uh, make sure you ask questions and they do have the skills and that they do have the experience to work with people who are experiencing uh, long difficulties or are living with chronic uh, lung disease. Okay, so now, um, lung disease and music therapy. Well, you know, what is it? Music therapy is quite a, a young and immature feel when we look at the big scope of things in, in health and allied health professions. Um, so we need, like any other health profession, to kind of back up what we're claiming, right? So um, there is some scientific evidence, and more and more, um, you know, findings are emerging in different aspects of how music is affecting different aspects of somebody else, uh, of somebody's life. Um, so I'm just gonna review briefly some studies that have been done. Um, because if, that's like I said, if we are saying, well, it can work this way for this, well, we have to back it up. We just are not doing trial and error here. So, um, in one study by Kanga, Azule, Raskin, and Lowy, Joanne Lowy, uh, they're in New York City, they um, looked at uh, the effect of a psychomusic therapy intervention on, yes, the respiratory system symptoms, psychological well-being and quality of life because people with uh, chronic illnesses, whether it's a lung disease or, or cancer or um, early Parkinson's, et cetera, et cetera, very, well, not, I don't wanna, I say often, uh, they can experience symptoms of depression and or anxiety and you know, depression and anxiety they go hand in hand most of the time. So in that study, um, they uh, had the music therapy group for the people with the you know, stand, standard care, and then they had the other group who just had the standard care without the music therapy group. So what they were doing in the music therapy group with those people, they did a lot of music imagery, so a lot of scripting, on top of music with different maybe relaxation scripts or anxiety management scripts or a body scans or a progressive muscle relaxation integrated with music. Uh, playing instruments and a, a wide variety of playing instruments from you know little gazoos <laughs> blowing in, uh, drumming, uh, percussion instruments, uh, 
different things, bells, what have you, and singing, singing weekly. And sometimes people are think, well, you know, I don't know somebody who's really impacted singing. Mm. Of course, you have to check with your, your doctor, but in this study, they didn't, nobody experienced adverse effects from the singing or blowing in the instruments. So the, in the results, there were improvements in symptoms of depression in the music therapy group. And uh, there was improvement in dyspnea and mastery in the music therapy group and fatigue went down for those patients. They felt more energized. Um, so we see our little choir in the middle. It just went by real quick. So in this study by Lord, it, so the previous one, I just want to say this is recent, I mean recent enough in 2015. Um, this was in 2010, so which is good about this, it was a randomized uh, controlled trial, which, you know, in health uh, professions and research, that's the gold standard. If you're going to conduct research, they will say it has to be a randomized controlled trial because, you know, you eliminate a lot of confounding variables and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what they did there is they had singing classes and they compared that when with people who were undergoing uh, usual care. So um, the singers, compared to the control group who didn't have the singing classes, um, their anxiety scores went down. And uh, the way they measured anxiety was uh, uh, you know, your, your standard, um, a standard Likert uh, scale type uh, for anxiety. I think maybe it was a Beck a back scale for anxiety, or I, I don't recall completely. Um, however, singing did not improve single breath counting, breath hold time, or shuttle walk distance. But on the qualitative elements of the study, there was a psychologist who interviewed the people, and uh, they were feeling uh, better about their, you know, uh, physically, uh, general well-being. Um, community and social support because they were singing as a group and uh, you know feeling proud of themselves that they they have they had accomplished something um, and I want to say with the, the singing in community there was a, a research that was done um, on um, choir members you know an established choir with people uh, at least 50 people in the choir and they put heart monitors on them and they were um, you know, uh, everybody had one, and when they started singing, after a few minutes of singing, regardless of the ages of people in the group, regardless of their gender, regardless of their physical capacity and body weight, etc., everybody's heartbeat was pretty much at the same time, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. So people were in synchronicity, not only in music making, but with their heartbeats. Um, and in this one, um, this was a lit re a review. Uh, a, you know, a bunch of scientists look at well, what if we look at all at l some studies that were conducted with uh, people living with chronic lung disease and and music. And of course, they had their inclu including, uh, inclusive criteria uh, to keep the studies in that they were going to look at. And of course, they had their exclusion. So and they, they ended up. Um, uh, just keeping a few studies and of course in the different studies uh, in some of them they were doing singing they were doing some listening some playing of music in half of the studies it was randomized uh, control trials and it was in a hospital setting so some of the studies were from six, six weeks and could go up to 21 months sample from 7 to 72 so that's uh, a big difference um, but Overall, in the studies that they kept, they did see that music showed improvement in psychological outcomes, such as quality of life, dyspnea, and anxiety. But there were some mixed results, depending on the study, for the physiological outcomes and breathing control among the individuals who were participants in the different studies. So this lit review was conducted in 2014. Um, I'm trying to go quick because this is the research stuff, but um, I feel very strong about you know, showing what's behind what we're doing. So, because some people have this idea that music is just singing kumbaya and holding hands and burning candles, but it's not. <laughs> so, um, this is very interesting because in this study, 
They had people walking for a few minutes. Some people were walking, listening to music, like an, uh, an iPod or, or something with a device that had recorded music, and some people walking without listening to music. And there are 30 people, a uh, mean age of 70 years old, plus or, uh, or minus. And so what they found in this study, that you know, there wasn't any significant differences between the two groups. So there were some positive aspects of listening to music when walking, but nothing significant. So what does this tell us? It tells us that, yes, recording music, okay, maybe it's a diversion and you know, your mind is taken off some things. Maybe you're just listening to the music and that's the distraction part of things. But it's not live music with the music therapist. The music therapist can be there and adapt to the person or the group of people they have in front of them. They can match their mood, they can match, if I'm, I'm working with somebody who has a chronic lung disease, I can match their rate, their respiratory rate, start from there and move it along. I can go a little faster, I can go a little slower. If somebody's struggling, I can stop. It's adaptable in the moment. You can do so much with live music. You can do playing of instrument, which is an interactive intervention. Listening is quite passive. Um, you can do a lot of listening for anxiety management, um, and you can do you know, a lot of cognitive stuff. Now, in those studies that we saw, yes, it's about singing and playing, but there's a lot of things that um, look at uh, cognitive skills. Um, you can do composition. You can do lyric analysis, and for a lot of people telling their story, it's not their favorite thing, but sometimes you give them a song or they bring in a song, and for some reason, that does it for them. And they'll say, this is the song I relate to now, and it's a great starting point to start talking. Does that make sense to people? Okay. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, it's what I do, so I'm quite biased, but at the same time, uh, this study, when I saw it, I'm like, of course there's no effect because music was recorded. So sometimes when you go in nursing homes, people are like, oh, this guy, he loves Mozart. We just put Mozart for him. Well, you know what? I like Mozart too, but I don't want to listen to Mozart all the time. You know, and those people very often, they're just sitting there and you know, they don't have the strength to say something or they're there and they have their headphones on and they'll have the music play for like five hours. It's like, well, what's, what's the point here? Like, so anyways, um, so what's happening? So <laughs> days of our lives. You remember the song for that? I remember I was watching it. I was like 13 years old. I've grown out of it. Some others haven't, <laughs> it's okay. So that's how it works. If Bob says it, that's how it works. I'm kidding. <laughs> so no, but uh, that's just one good thing about music is when it hits you, you feel no pain. Uh, legendary Bob Marley. But seriously, how it works. Okay, I have to say, you see at the bottom here, this guy, Daniel Levitin, he's right here in Montreal. He's at McGill University. He's head of the Music and Cognition Lab. He's Mr. Neuroscientist who just happens to think that music is the greatest thing that could ever happen to cognition. <laughs> so he's the guy who wrote, this is your brain on music. And this is the guy who, he was a sound uh, engineer before becoming a neuroscientist. And he also wor uh, wrote the book, The World in Six Songs. Um, so he wrote this article, and it's about the neurochemistry of music and the different pathways that music, depending on how you use it, uh, how they're activated, and how it works with the different enzymes, the different proteins, the different neurotransmitters, and the messengers, and everything. So, you know, like uh, doc the doctor before me, uh, you know, he had all this very complicated stuff on there. This is as complicated as it gets on my slides. <laughs> so, uh, of course, you know, we've got our little brain up there working, but basically, depending on what you're doing in music, it works in mostly those four domains. So you've got your reward systems in the brain, motivation and pleasure, so a lot of dopamine gets fired up, 
and opioids, you know, like your natural endorphins are kicking in. Uh, with music, um, you know you've got the runner high, but you've got the musician high also. Uh, and uh, also for stress and arousal, of course the cortisol hormone, uh, the secretion, and then um, I'm not going to try to say those words because, you know, English is not my first tongue and I'm probably going to massacre how to say those, but I'm just going to go with CRH and ACTH. Um, immunity. Um, uh, and then there's uh, the via, uh, via serotonin production and peptide, peptide der see, I can't say it. Yeah, the, the POMC. <laughs> um, and um, also with the secretion of oxytocin, social uh, affiliation, oxytocin is, you know, is known as the bonding hormone. So um, with the work that I do, a lot of people, my colleagues, do work on, on immunity because they work in a hospital setting. Um, I don't, my, mo the, my big things are reward, uh, stress management and anxiety reduction and, and social stuff. That's ma mainly what, what I do. So, this was my, my technical, these are my references. Um, I'm just looking at the time here. So, I wanted to kind of go quick and not make this too long because I brought my arsenal here and uh, I'd like to interact with you and if you have some questions, whether it's about, well, what do you do when you have this person presenting with this, what kind of intervention do you do? So I'm open to your questions, I'm open to your suggestions and remarks and we'll go from here. Yes, maybe, no? Oh, question. I just have a remark. Um, my granddaughter, who I'm raising, she uh, has a whole bunch of um, like um, labels, like ADHD and ODD and rage disorder and on and on, and um, uh, hasn't done very well in school so far, but loves the church choir and loves the Christmas pageant and loves the Easter play and so she memorizes everybody's parts in the plays and she knows all the songs to every single mm -hmm. all the words to all the songs and like I just keep saying that to the doctor like she can do it if she's interested or if she has passion sure. for it but when you make her sit in a desk like it's not the same thing for her for sure and so I just um, like as a like a qualification for the value of this. Like I really see it in my home with an mm -hmm. eight-year-old who just doesn't want to sit still but knows every single word of every single song and can sing to you for hours and just loves it. So Yeah, for a lot it, of kids, it's a very big motivator. So, you know, intrinsic to the music, there's your reinforcer and there's your motivator. So you don't have to add anything external to it. So as I, they're doing it... They're quite motivated, and you can really cash in on that to work on the, you know, the things that need to be worked on. Absolutely, like serotonin, like happier and calmer and all that. So right. thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Come on, guys, I have all my stuff. Yes. <laughs> stop is that true <laughs> well that I don't know <laughs> but yeah but m music definitely has you know quality for and en en entrainment for sure or you know when you have some front of I, a lot of times what I'll do if I have somebody who's super anxious in front of me and they're really restless and they can't sit still and they're quite occupied in their minds with their thoughts and emotions that are just a big blur um, you know, I, I try to start at their level where they're at, whether it's on my, my clarinet, actually, because the clarinet has a very low register, and uh, it's got this woody sign, sound to it, and it very quickly, just the quality of it can bring somebody down, and I try to match them, you know, their speed, and gradually I bring them down. So, of course, if you bring it way too down, then, of course, you're... <laughs> 
you know, you can get to a place. I've had people fall asleep in my sessions because they, were, they got to the point where they were so relaxed that they were like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, it worked <laughs> a little too well. So, yeah. Another question over here? Could you give us an example of what you might recommend for people who have shortness of breath, for instance? Okay. What kind of music therapy would you do? Um, there are a lot of things I would do, um, depending if I you know, had um, a child or a, a teenager and an adult. But one thing that I would do, um, we can do some um, singing, or we can do... Here, let me show. I'm going to go get something real quick. Um, so. So. Sorry, I probably got out of the light a little. But, um, so with kids, most parents in here, this is bringing up nightmares, right? <laughs> but this is a great tool because I have kids that will just... Yes, you know, their breathing is difficult for them, but you know what? They blow through this, and they're quite happy, and they're blowing for a long time. Uh, sometimes I do have to stop them because, you know, they're getting a little um, overworked up. Um, so the, the recorder, let's say, does not have a lot of resistance. So right away for the kid or the person, what does it do? You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what the kid does. Yay! Um, so they, you know, they, they play in this, and right away they have a sound. So they feel pretty good about themselves because, you know what, I didn't do much, and something's coming out, and it's nice, and, and it's, well, pretty. We, we can agree to disagree, but, but they've got something, you know, like. So, and it's, you're like, okay, you know, and then you can just teach them to lift one finger up or down, and then they feel happy that they've played a few notes. And then you can move on to think, the gazoo also doesn't offer a lot of resistance, and there are a lot of games that I do with the gazoo, and it's a, a work also, you know, I combine impulse control with that, because I'm playing my guitar, let's say, and when I stop, they can play. And then when I start again, they have to stop. And so it's a back and forth, so they really have to control when they're going to play, and most kids really want to blow in that thing. Um, and then I move up to more resistant things, uh, when they've outgrown this and they can control it somehow. They're, you know, the bigger flutes, you can go to alto, you can go to tenor, and then there's the whistle, the train whistle that I have. Um, do I have it here? Yeah. I have this, you know, and that is wood and it's got just two little holes here, so that's quite resistant. <laughs> And then I have a train song, and then when it's their cue, they, and then they're quite excited. And because it's more resistant, you know, it gives them a break because it's hard work for them. Um, and then also what's great is karaoke for the kids, but also this. Hello. And then it, you know, it vibrates and they're quite happy. For uh, people who are not children, of course, you know, if you take this out, well, you know. Um, we try really hard to go with age-appropriate material and, and music that they relate to. We don't pick the music, by the way. The person in front of us or the group, will. we, we go with their preferred music. Uh, music can be a very strong inducer for emotions. So when I have a group, I really make sure that if we're going to sing, I make sure that the songs that we're going to sing are okay because for some people it can be a trigger. Even if like it's... You are my sunshine. For a lot of people, you know, they have a good positive association with it. But there was a gentleman in one of the nursing homes I worked in in Michigan. You know, that song for him reminded him when his spouse had died. He was singing that to her as she was actively dying. So, this, so you really have to be careful. Music, people think, oh, it's, you know, it, it does present some, it, it can be sometimes a, uh, like dangerous is, is a strong word, but it, it can bring you places that can be very difficult to get people out of. Um, I have these little things too. And this is, this is a lot of effort to blow in those things and get that thing rolling. It's a lot to ask for your lungs. So I really vary and you know, I make sure that the, the people, but I, I was gonna go to the adults. So with adults, I do a lot of singing um, and um, of course, songs that they prefer. 
And depending on their breath capacity, I will play the song faster so they don't have to sing those longer phrases. If they need to stop, I can stop. We can do breathing exercises, and that we can do with, um, I have my sound tubes here. Oh, they're here. So you see how I have different lengths of, of tubes? Of course, those tubes are meant to be hit, and they make pitches. But what I do, you know, we can blow in them and try to get the breath on the other side, and I hold a little tissue, and then it can move. And then as you make the tube longer, of course, it's more difficult. Um, so sometimes with those things, I do stories with sound effects. So the people are making up stories, and they can use those to make wind. They can use the, someone knocking or rain falling or things like that. So it's, it's quite varied. And because they're using the tubes for different things, it's not always their lungs that are being solicited. So it gives them a break, and then they can go back to to blowing. Um, but singing is really great because sometimes, um, like if I... I'll give you an example. Um, you know the song, um, I don't know if this, maybe some of you won't know it, but um, Let Me Call You Sweetheart. You know, let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love with you. So you know at, at the end there's, I'm in love with you. So that, ah, uh, I can play a lot with that. And the thing is, in that song, too, is, um, you know, let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love with you. You know, it's the same pitch, but it's a long phrase. So we can play around with the speed of that, and the older adults I work with, you know, it's a song that they relate to, they really like it, so they don't mind singing it over and over. And then the bonus on that is then very often they'll start reminiscing, too, and they'll tell me about the great life that they had and everything. So when we talk about you know, psychological well-being and ripple effects on other aspects, it's great. So um, that's definitely one way. Like singing is, we can do so much in singing, but that's one way that I would work with somebody who's having uh, breathing uh, problems. Anything else, any questions? So if, if you are curious about music therapy, you can go into the Canadian Association for Music Therapy website uh, and get more information on that. Uh, every province, and um, I think one territory, uh, we, we all have our, so our provincial associations and you can find a music therapist uh, on those websites. And if you are curious and if you are wanting to maybe get music therapy services, you can contact those people, make a request, and very often people will contact you back. But make sure you ask your questions if people have experience working with people who have chronic lung diseases or, or respiratory problems because a lot of people can say, you know, they work with people with autism yeah, it's great, but they maybe don't have the skills to work with people that have uh, physical issues. So, we, you want to get out of here, huh? <laughs> I, I understand, you know, it's the weekend. So, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, and um, I, for me, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure to come and share my, my passion and my knowledge with people. So, you know, spread the word. <laughs> and uh, I wish everybody in here all the best and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.